thank you all for coming. I, I appreciate this lovely audience, and um, I'm glad to be back here. I, I did a talk at, at Bookstock two years ago, also about my other book, Before the Court of Heaven, but um, uh, I, I also just want to acknowledge and thank the Vermont Humanities Council for sponsoring um, this talk. Uh, the, um, the folks at, at the Humanities Council are really the, the stewards, the benefactors, and the curators of both um, the arts and nonprofits in Vermont, and I, I like to think of them as our other gorgeous landscape. Um, and I think they deserve our generous support. And I also, I, I want to thank Woodstock Community Television um, for uh, taping the event, and which then will make that available to people who could not be here tonight. Um, and I want to thank the, the Woodstock History Center for, uh, for sponsoring this, for co-sponsoring this, this event as well. Um, so uh, let me just briefly uh, introduce myself. I, um, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of the backstory of, of this book um, shortly, but um, just as a, as a brief introduction, I'm, a, um, I'm a, a pediatrician and a writer. Uh, I live in Middlebury. Um, I've, I've been in practice in Vermont since 1976, and my first practice was up on the Canadian border, Enosburg Falls and Richford. Um, which was, I was in a solo pediatric practice. It was a, a, a most surprising and interesting decade of, of my life and a very rewarding practice. Um, I was a country doctor there for, for 10 years. I, I, um, I bartered medical care for eggs and for firewood and for knitted Afghans, and um, it was an interesting experience. Uh, b uh, between 1987 and 1991, I was a National Cancer Institute Fellow in Epidemiology at Columbia University. I decided to, to try the academic route for a while, and I was, um, in, uh, I was part of a, a research um, group in pediatric environmental toxicology, which was a, a new field in those days. Now it's quite established. Um, I returned to Vermont in 1991 and established Rainbow Pediatrics in, uh, in Middlebury, where I still practice um, now. Um, and I'm also an instructor in pediatrics at the University of Vermont School of Medicine. Um, I'm also an adjunct faculty at Middlebury College for pre-med students, and uh, I mentor them. Um, f as my, my writing bio uh, it, it is... Um, mostly from the Breadloaf Writers Conference, which I've attended three times, uh, twice for fiction and once for poetry. Um, Life in a Jar is my first book, which is, and it's nonfiction. Uh, my second book, is, which is historical fiction, is uh, called Before the Court of Heaven. Um, and both of these books are about, the, uh, about World War II and the rise of the Third Reich and, um, and about rescuers which is something I have a particular sort of interest in. Um, so I, I have three goals for tonight's uh, presentation. The, the first is that I, I hope that you'll learn a little bit about the, the Warsaw Ghetto and about this, this particular uh, history, this slice of Holocaust history, um, and, and also how a Vermont pediatrician came to write about this history. Uh, second, I want to tell you two remarkable true stories, uh, the, which are, I think, exemplars of the power of one person to change the world. One is Irena Sendler's story, which is her story during World War II. And 60 years later, three teenage girls from Kansas. And Life in a Jar is, and you'll see how these two stories come together, um, Life in a Jar is really an invitation for us all to emulate both Irena Sendler and these Kansas teens. You know, when, when I read Holocaust literature, it generally leaves me either feeling depressed or angry or helpless. Um, one of the reasons why I wrote this book is that this story, these two stories, um, are, were, are really inspirational as well as informative. 
And the impact of Life in a Jar, of this, of this project, the Life in a Jar project, that it's had on Poland and on Jewish-Polish dialogue has been nothing short of remarkable. Um, and I will, the, the slides I show you at the end will, will illustrate some of, some of what ha has happened as a result of this project. Um, and finally, I want to talk briefly about how we teach the Holocaust to this next generation of young people who are now really three generations removed from, from that history. Um, I, I want to raise the question of the bystander, which to some, in some sense we all are. The uh, German has a better word for bystander, or a more complicated word for bystander, and that, that word is Mitlaufer, and loosely translated it means fellow traveler. The, um, and it's, it refers to those, almost always the majority, who make accommodations with evil. And however you understand that word, accommodations, um, to me. Um, so, who saves one person saves the world entire. This is an oft-quoted line from the Hebrew Babylonian Talmud. Norm Kennard, the Kansas social studies teacher who inspired and continues the Irena Sendler project, painted a paraphrase of this quote from the Talmud over the top of his, over the front of his classroom, and his paraphrase was, who changes one person changes the world. So I'm going to tell you these two remarkable true stories. The first about Irena Sendler, a Polish Catholic social worker who organized a network of rescuers to um, rescue 2,500 Jewish children from certain death in the Warsaw Ghetto. And the second story about three girls from a small rural high school in Kansas who uncovered Irena Sendler's forgotten story 60 years later and told the world. Liz, Megan, and Sabrina began as students of history and they became agents of history. Most stories about partisans and resistance during World War II are stories of, of men and of fighting. Uh, this is a story about women and, and about rescue and about three teenage girls from Kansas. The epigraph of, of my book is by Albert Schweitzer and it goes like this. Sometimes our light goes out but is blown again into instant flame by an encounter with another human being. Each of us owes the deepest thanks to those who have rekindled this inner light. Life in a Jar, the Irena Sendler Project, is the true story of Irena Sendler, a Holocaust hero, and these three contemporary teenagers from Kansas who have rekindled that light. And I hope that it's also an invitation for all of us to be inspired to carry that inner light as well. So, I want to begin with a disclaimer of sorts, and I think this is important. Um, stories of rescuers like Irena Sendler do not correct the catastrophe of the Holocaust. There is, there is no healing of the Holocaust. Rescue is not some sort of redemptive postscript to the Holocaust. The harm cannot be redeemed. So if not healing, then what? Well, truth and reconciliation. And let me offer a, a more familiar analogy. Uh, when a person suffers a heart attack and they're lucky enough to survive, they're always le their heart has ne never completely heals. There's always a scar left in the heart afterwards. And when something as terrible as the Holocaust happens, it too leaves a deep wound, a scar that can also never fully heal. And when you have a wounded heart, you have to be careful. And you're never the same. It's it's really the wound that keeps both the, the history alive and the memory of what happened. And it's a way of making sure that you don't repeat this catastrophe. So by telling these stories, by keeping this history alive, we're caring for this wound, this scar that we all share in some way. Uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, a progressive Jewish theologian and a civil rights leader, said of the Holocaust, few are guilty but all are responsible. It's our responsibility to tell this story in all its dimensions as a way of passing the torch of memory to the next generations 
because memory really is the best immunization against recurrence. When the last eyewitnesses are gone, when the last survivors succumb to old age, our young people must know this story so that they will recognize inhumanity when it recurs, as it does with appalling regularity. Bosnia, Cambodia, Rwanda, Nigeria, the Congo, Darfur, Syria, Yemen, Myanmar, the list goes on. As a pediatrician, I immunize against infectious disease, and as a writer, I invoke memory as our best immunization against the atrocities that humans tend to inflict upon each other. A sort of ethical immunization to foster justice, love, and respect against the diseases of hatred, intolerance, and violence. So, um, what I'd like to do is to show you these slides as a way of kind of grounding our discussion tonight in the, uh, in the history. Um, and with one exception, these first slides that I'm going to show you were taken by perpetrators. These are photographs that were taken by Nazi photographers. Most of them were taken in 1942. And the purpose of these photographs was for um, propaganda purposes in, in Germany, and it was to further humiliate and degrade um, the Jews. Um, but it forms an interesting archive for us to consider today. So September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland, and that was the beginning of the Second World War. Um, within a month of the invasion, Warsaw fell to, to the Germans. Um, and the, the German authorities, the occupation authorities in, German, in Germany, um, then imposed a government on, uh, an occupied government on the people of, of all of Poland, and in particular in Warsaw, the, um, one of the first decrees that was issued by the Germans as occupiers was that all Jews should be identified either with a yellow star, which is the one that's probably most familiar to people, the yellow um, star of David, or, as was the case in Warsaw, a white armband with a blue uh, star of David on it. Uh, this photograph was taken in the, in the Warsaw ghetto um, you, you can see everybody over the age of 10 has the armband on their right arm, which was required for them to, to display. The, um, what interests me most about this photograph is that, with one exception, everybody in this photograph is rather poorly dressed and, and malnourished. You can see these children are barefoot, they're very, very th their extremities are very thin. Um, the, uh, the, most everybody is wearing kind of threadbare clothing. The one exception is this woman right here. She is a Jew. She has the armband on her right forearm. My supposition is that she is part of the black market that developed in, um, throughout all of occupied Poland, but in particular in Warsaw when food rationing was established as one of the decrees that the Germans imposed upon the population of, of Poland. And the way the rationing system worked was if you were a Pole of German extraction, if you could prove that your, your ethnicity was German, then you had full rations of 2,600 calories a day. Um, Catholic Poles, so-called Aryan Poles, uh, received 700 calories a day. And Jews received 184 calories a day. So these are starvation rations. You cannot survive on that, that level of, of caloric intake. Uh, consequently, very rapidly, a black market for food developed, which um, made some people relatively wealthy. The Nazis were skimming off the top of this black market as well. Um, there, um, and it's interesting how this sort of in this sociogram of the of the ghetto was completely jumbled and inverted so that people who before the war were relatively wealthy became suddenly impoverished and people who were inclined to in, to involve themselves in this criminal activity of the black market became relatively wealthy um, so Th there in the ghetto there were cafes there were nightclubs there was a theater um, you could obtain almost anything in the ghetto with the right connections and with the right amount of, of money. Um, and the people, and everybody had to be complicit with this criminal enterprise 
because otherwise you would starve to death. So it, there really was this vast criminal conspiracy that everybody was part of. And my guess is this, this woman is, was one of the, the recipients of that. Um, in a, about a year after the Germans um, invaded, they, um, in 1940, October of 1940, the um, Occupation authorities in Warsaw uh, declared the ghetto. They said all the Jews must now be relocated into a uh, into a ghetto area. Um, the they ordered the Jews to buy the bricks, supply the slave labor, and build the wall that would surround the ghetto. And here's a photograph of the wall. It was um, it was. Uh, 11 miles long, it was 10 feet high, topped with shards of broken glass. Um, and about a month later was November 16th, 1940, was the day that all the Jews in Warsaw had to go into the, the ghetto. They could only take with them what they could carry on their backs, so every, you see the, the satchels that people are carrying. Um, and the, the density of the ghetto was such that 30% of the population of Warsaw, that's the Jewish population of Warsaw, 30% was squeezed into 2.4% of the area of the city. Consequently, at any, every apartment or flat would have it, at easily eight or nine people per room, so not per bedroom, but per room, so a three-room flat might easily have 25 people, often people who didn't know each other. The Warsaw Ghetto was the largest ghetto in occupied Europe. It was so large it was actually divided into a large ghetto and a small ghetto and the, uh, that was connected by this wooden footbridge over Chodna Street. Chodna Street was not in the ghetto and here you see automobiles, there are trams, people are walking on the street and they don't have armbands on. On the other side of the wall, you see people with armbands. Um, there, there's no vehicular traffic, and the only way, and that they had to go across this uh, iconic footbridge. And remember this footbridge at the end. I'm going to show you what this looks like today in in Poland. Um, at, at least 10% of children in the uh, Jewish children in the ghetto were actively begging for food on the other side of the wall, which would mean that they would they would manage to escape from through holes in the wall, through gates. There were 22 gates in the um, in the the, the the wall around the ghetto, um, and they would they would be in Aryan Warsaw and begging for food, usually, food, uh, usually uh, root crops, that they would then bring back to their families to supplement the, their nutrition. Uh, these four children have been arrested by this SS officer for begging on, in the, on the Aryan side of the, of the wall. Um, minutes later, they deposit the root crops that they had begged and gathered on the other side. Um, the fate of these children would be that they would be sent to Gensia prison, there were two prisons in the Warsaw Ghetto, Gensia and Paviak. Uh, Gensia prison was for children, and the mortality rate in Gensia prison was virtually 100% because of uh, infectious disease, exposure, malnutrition. Um, so these children would not have survived the war. Um, I, I, Irena Sendler was a Polish Catholic social worker before the war. Um, she had many, many of her clients were Jewish, and when the ghetto was established, she, she obtained a forged pass that identified her as a, an infection control nurse, which allowed her to go, through, to go in and out of the ghetto through the gates past the Nazi guards. Um, the Nazis were very par were completely paranoid about infectious disease. Um, they didn't care what happened to the Jews, but they didn't want it to spread to the rest of Warsaw and the occupying troops. Um, so they were very happy to have some of the public health uh, people from Warsaw go in and, and monitor infectious disease. So she was able to go in and out. She would bring with her money or food to bring and would continue to visit some of her clients that she had before the war. And 
as she w went in frequently to the ghetto, she would walk by scenes like this. And this is one of the main streets in the ghetto. And she would pass these children who you can see how thin their legs are and emaciated they are. These two children are probably orphans. Um, and she would see the same starving people and children every day in, as the weather got colder and the winter went on. She would frequently see them dead on the street from the, from the next morning. And it was the plight of these orphans that initiated her desire to, to take some of these children out of the ghetto and to, to smuggle them out. And she created a network of, with nine other social workers. Um, and so there were ten social workers and nine of them were women, one was a man. Um, and she started taking the, take, they started by taking orphans out. Um, and they would get them out through holes in the wall, through, through gaps. They, they, um, there was a morgue wagon that went through the ghetto every day to collect bodies. They would sometimes put these, have these children in the morgue, in the morgue wagon with, the, with the, the corpses from the day before. Many ingenious ways. Young children were, um, were given sedatives and were, were, were taken out. Um, it's, taking orphans out was easy because Irena didn't have to ask anybody's permission. She didn't have to at, a, approach parents to get them out. So there was really no, no ethical dilemma for her about taking these children out. Um, so at the, um, at the start, at the initiation of the ghetto, there were about 350,000 Jews in the, in the ghetto. And that was about 30% of Warsaw's population. Um, the, as the fighting progressed and the war, refugees from the fighting, particularly from Czechoslovakia and from, uh, and from Austria, um, came into Poland at seeking, uh, seeking refuge and would, want, would find their way to Warsaw. And then they were added to the ghetto. So the, um, at its peak, there were um, 460,000 Jews. These are approximations, but almost a half a million uh, Jews. So the, the population of the ghetto actually increased as um, w within about six to nine months af um, after the ghetto was established. Uh, this is a photograph of a. Um, uh, there was then no place for people to sleep anymore. Th this is a, f a photograph of a, um, a synagogue in the ghetto, which was then turned into a, a, a dormitory, and people slept, had to sleep there. Um, so on July 22, 1942, the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto began. The term liquidation was the term that was used when, when ghettos were emptied of people and the, the residents were taken either to um, concentration camps, to extermination camps, or to work camps. Um, the, uh, the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto were taken to Treblinka which was not a concentration camp, but an extermination camp. There are no barracks at Treblinka. It, within two hours of arrival, the Jews were, were murdered in the gas chambers at Treblinka, and then their bodies cremated. Um, there were so many Jews in the ghetto that it took two months to empty out um, the ghetto to take, take them to Treblinka. And the way it was accomplished was that the um, German troops would surround a couple of square block, block area of the ghetto. They would order everybody out into the street. Um, and then they would rely on Jewish policemen to actually do the, um, obtain their quota of people. The, these three guys back here, oh, it, well, it, these are the people that have been rounded up on this particular day's roundup. Here's the SS officer who's in charge of the operation. But the actual rounding up of Jews and taking them to the train loading platform was accomplished by Jewish policemen. These guys have the peaked caps. They're Jewish. You can see the armbands on their right arm. Um, the, um, e every ghetto had a, what was called a Judenrat, which was a Jewish council, so that when the Germans made a decree, they would pass the decree on to the Jewish council, and it was then the obligation of the Jewish council to impose the decree on the Jews. Um, so part of the, the, um, the responsibility of the Jewish council in Warsaw was, was to gather up the Jews for deportation. Um, so, and they, they had to use the Jewish policemen. The, the, the deal that the Germans made with the Jewish council was that 
as long as the Jewish policemen gathered their quota of Jews every day for, for deportation, that they would not be deported. They and their families would not be deported. On the last day of the deportation, the Jewish policemen and their families were rounded up and taken to Treblinka. Um, so the, when, anywhere between 5,000 and 13,000 Jews a day would be taken to the train loading platform, uh, which was called Umschlagplatz, and there they would be put into cattle cars for transport to Treblinka, anywhere between 100 to 120 Jews per cattle car. Um, if there were not enough cattle cars to accommodate the people who had been, uh, had been gathered, uh, then the Jews would sit there overnight at Umschlagplatz. A, there was a field there, they would sit there overnight. There was no food, there was no water, no, no toilet facilities, and then they would be loaded the next day into the cattle cars. Um, a photograph of Jews being, being loaded at Umschlagplatz to, um, I into the cattle cars. Again, there, there's no sense of shame about this, that there's something wrong with this, with, with these, this photograph that was taken. Um, so the, the deportation, uh, the ghetto was largely emptied by September 21st, 1942. The Germans left 35,000 Jews in the ghetto because they, they, had, um, they had little workshops and factories in the ghetto that were producing war material for the Germans. So th this was a slave labor force that they kept in, in the ghetto to continue producing in these small factories. There were an additional 30 to 35,000 Jews who had a, a looted capture when, when the roundups were occurring, and they were hidden in, in bunkers, in, in crawl spaces. In, uh, uh, they, they managed to find their way through the underground um, of, of Warsaw and to, to survive. About 700 of them obtained weapons or made their own weapons, made their own explosives. Um, obtained weapons through the sewer system from the resistance outside of the ghetto, um, and they rose up against the, the Germans on April 19th, 1943. So this is now, you know, about eight months or so after the, the liquidation of the ghetto. Um, and when the, when the Jews rose up, this was the first armed insurrection in a city in occupied Europe. It was the largest, it was the most successful. They held off the Germans for almost a month. It took, it took the Germans um, from April 19th to May, um, May 16th to put down the, uh, the Jewish uprising. So this photograph was taken, about, uh, um, was taken six days after the uprising began. The Jews were now fighting against the Germans on, in the ghetto. Um, Irena walked by this fair. I, I had the pleasure and the honor of, of meeting Irena and interviewing her. And uh, we spent some lovely time together talk, talking, of, and she told me many of the stories that are in, that are in the book. Um, and she told me the story of walking by this fair. This fair was adjacent to the ghetto. The, the wall around the ghetto was in the back part of this, of this Easter fair. Um, Oh, unfortunately, oh, okay, this, you, you don't, th this is a swing, and th this was, th this slide was cut off. Um, there is a child on, a, on, the, up, on, the, on the top of the, of the arc of the swing here. Every time that child swings up, there, she or he is looking over the wall into the ghetto where there is a pitched battle going on. There is fighting, there's, um, there's artillery, there's gunfire, there, um, there's smoke rising, um, and on this side of the wall were Polish Catholics trying to have some, normal, some semblance of, uh, of normality with this Easter fair that was going on. And Irena said it was the most, um, it was an experience of extreme cognitive dissonance to hear gunfire on one side and to watch this fair on the other side. Um, and it was most, most disturbing to her. Um, So once the liquidation of the ghetto began, then the rescue network that Irena had put together of these 10 social workers um, 
they then were, at, were going to people's doors, knocking on doors and, and asking people to give up their children. So they were then um, asking parents to, um, to surrender their children to, to save them. Each of these social workers had a liaison group of up to 25 or so young, um, mostly women, who were, some, some of them were Jewish in the ghetto, some of them were Catholic on the Aryan side of the wall, who would assist in the rescues, in, the, um, in getting the children out, sneak, uh, sneaking them out of the ghetto. Um, when a child was taken out of the ghetto, they would first have to go to one of these emergency care homes. This is a gentleman who ha he's taking a, a false back out of a closet, and children would be hidden here in these emergency care homes until they had um, forged documents with their new Polish identity, which, which they would require in order to be then placed in a foster home or a convent or an orphanage where the, where the children were then, uh, were then placed for safety. Um, okay. Um, th this is the one photograph that was not taken by a Nazi photographer. This was taken by an Allied airman flying over Warsaw after the Germans had been defeated, had, had um, retreated from Warsaw. And this, the devastation that this shows is not because Warsaw was bombed, because Warsaw was not bombed. This was all caused by the Germans systematically blowing up and destroying the city as they retreated. Um, and they had the decency to preserve the churches, which I always found somewhat interesting. Um, so every church in Warsaw was not destroyed, but every 95% uh, of, the, of the city itself was, was leveled. Um, now, the... Um, when Irena and her, when, when this network would rescue a child, and, and this was Irena's idea, and she felt very strongly about it, that each of these children should be, that their names should be written onto a piece of paper, there were tissue paper, um, to, I, to um, with their Jewish name, then there was an arrow to their new Polish name with their forged documents, and where they were being hidden. The, the reason, f and there were two reasons for this. One was, the practical reason was that the, um, the resistance, the, the Polish resistance was supplying money and, f and or food for the, either the, the, the foster parents, the orphanages, the, the, um, the convents who were hiding these children. They had to know where, where they were so they could provide that, that support. More important to Irena was that she said she wanted these children to know their Jewish names. She wanted them to know who they were, because many of these uh, children were babies that were removed, or toddlers who were removed and then put in, in, foster, in foster home, um, in foster homes. Um, so the, the, the list, it, every time they, they would take a child out, they, the name would be added to the list. It, there were only two people who knew where the lists were, because obviously these would be a very hazardous thing for the Nazis to, to get their hands on. Um, so Irena and one of her co-conspirators, Yaga Piotrowska, um, w were the only people who knew where the, li the lists were buried. They would put them in, in glass jars and then bury these jars under an apple tree in um, Yaga Piotrowska's backyard. Um, and then every few weeks they would dig up the jars, put the new lists in, and then re rebury them. Um, and this is where the title of um, both my book and the play that this is based on uh, comes from, Life in a Jar. Um, so let me, um, let, let me tell you a little bit of my history and how I came to to write this story, and, I, and there's more to this story to come because there's a contemporary piece to this as well. Um, I'm, I'm a German Jew. I was born after the war. My parents narrowly escaped the Holocaust. Others in my family did not. We settled in the northern part of Manhattan, the Washington Heights region. I don't know if some of you are familiar with that. It's the northern part of Manhattan where most of the German Jewish survivors um, in New York settled. Um, it was a, it was, I, I grew up in basically a European shtetl. I, I didn't speak English until I was five years old and went to school. Um, everybody in Washington Heights spoke German. 
the, the, the butcher was German, the fish store was German, the dairy was German, the newspaper, the Aufbau was a German newspaper. Um, so I, I was growing up in Europe, and it, it was not until I went to school that I, that really, that America opened up to me as a different world. We lived with, uh, with my, my grandmother and my uncle, um, who my grandmother never, never spoke English. Um, and, the, and the adults around us who had survived the Holocaust. And so, uh, you know, the, the Holocaust was kind of the, both the baffling and the iconic story of, of my childhood. Um, it, was, it was the subject of kind, of kind of frightening and mysterious and sort of it was impossible to grasp, but it was all around me. It was kind of the atmosphere. Um, there, uh, the grown-ups around me ha had this sort of this, this awkward gracelessness about they didn't want the children to know about this, um, yet we would hear their conversation. Um, there was sort of a furtiveness that they had, which I now understand to be a kind of a post-traumatic stress disorder that really everybody in the world had after the war in some, in, in some measure or another. Um, the Holocaust was the unacknowledged elephant in the living room. It was, um, it was huge, but it was shrouded. When I give this talk to, um, to students, to high school and middle school students, um, I ask them how many have seen or read Harry Potter, and everybody raises their hand. Um, and I say, well, the Holocaust in some sense was like the evil Lord Voldemort, he who must not be named. And really, it w there, was a, there was a sort of a silence uh, kind of uh, about the Holocaust after, after the war. Um, even many times when I give the talk, someone comes up to me and tells me about their, their uncle or their father or their grandfather who came back from the war and would not talk about what, what had happened. So there was this, there was this silence and this denial um, ab um, about what had happened. Um, I, the way this kind of dreadful silence manifested in, in my life was it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I learned that my grandfather had been arrested on Kristallnacht in Germany and was imprisoned in Dachau. He was in Dachau for six months and the only reason he got out was that my grandmother um, had gone to high school with one of the administrative guards at Dachau and he accepted a bribe from her. Um, again, I was in my 20s. I, I never knew this history. Um, my parents were interviewed by, for the Steven Spielberg Shoah Project in 1999, and during that um, interview, my mother produced her um, identity card from growing up in Germany, um, which is stamped with a, with a Jew. Um, and she also showed her um, nursing certificate from the, the nursing school in Frankfurt that she attended, which had, um, which had swastikas on it. She, she graduated from that in 1938. Um, again, I had never, never known about, about this. Um, so, how does a Vermont pediatrician come to be connected with this story? Um, and this is a, a little bit of a ghost story. Um, so, I, you know some of my background. Um, I'm a member of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. I send them my donation every year. They send me a calendar every year. Um, and um, I, I was in my office in, um, in 2001, and I get the 2002 Holocaust Memorial Museum calendar. And I, it, this was before electronic medical records, so I just got a, a stack of mail that was just, you know, staggering and astounding. Um, and, I, and everything had about two seconds to get either recycled or thrown away or kept. So I look at this calendar I got, I quickly thumb through it, and I come to this page, Irena Sendlerova, and what stopped me was, that, was this photograph, because she looks like my niece, Rosie. And so I'm thumbing through this calendar, I looked at it and I said, oh, that's Rosie. Oh, no, that's Irena Sendlerova. So, the Holocaust Museum, right, they're the people who know everything. They had this, her date's wrong. They said she was born in 1916. She was born in 1910. They didn't know if she was still alive. It said unknown. And then there's this short paragraph below that said that she had rescued 2,500 Jewish children from the Warsaw Ghetto. And I said, huh? Who? I never heard of her. 
I'm Jewish. I'm a pediatrician. Everybody knows Oskar Schindler. He rescued 1,100 Jews from a, a German concentration camp in Poland. I said, why don't I know her? So this, this was, I was sort of gobsmacked. So I kept this. Um, I, I have a file in my desk that's labeled interesting stuff. <laughs> I now have four files that are labeled interesting stuff. And I recommend you all have at least one, one like that. So I put this in that file, and it sat there for three years. Um, and then in um, February of 2004, I came into my office one night to see a sick child, and open on my desk is a copy of the Ladies Home Journal, which I don't keep in my waiting room. No offense to the Ladies Home Journal. Um, but it was open to this article called The Woman Who Loved Children. And it was an article about... Um, these three Kansas teenagers who had discovered Irena Sendler's forgotten story um, and had done a history project and, and sort of told the world about this forgotten um, amazing Holocaust hero. So I, I, I've been a closet writer all my life I, and I, was to, I hadn't published anything by then. Um, but I was thinking of writing a short novella, short fiction about the Warsaw Ghetto. I, I thought, oh, Irena Sendler, what an interesting character. I called Norm Kennard, the teacher of these kids. Um, and I, um, I, just for more information about Irena Sendler, and, about, and he, he gets on the phone and he says, you know, it's interesting you should call um, because we were looking for a writer to, tell, to write both stories, both Irena's wartime story and the contemporary story of these Kansas teenagers. Um, and um, at that point, I really thought of myself as, as a, a fiction writer and a poet, and I said, mm, I don't think so. I think you need a nonfiction writer. Um, and, but we talked some more. He, he said, would you send, send us a writing sample? Um, so I sent him a short story I had written. He calls me back, and he says, I like the way you write. Would you come out and meet us? So the slippery slope. <laughs> um, so now it's November 2004. Um, I went out to, to Kansas uh, with a, an audio cassette recorder and a ton of tapes um, and just to meet them and to see if this was something I could even entertain doing. In the interim, the, what, the, thought that I, the thoughts that I had and what compelled me to finally do this was um, that this was a contemporary story as well as, a, as a, a history story. And the way these two stories came together was really compelling. And, and, and I thought, boy, this is really interesting. This is different. This is not your usual Holocaust memoir or diary or, or exposition. Um, so I, I went out to Kansas. Um, I rented a car at the airport. I drove down to um, Uniontown, Kansas. So this is this Bourbon County, Kansas, southeast Kansas. Have any of you ever been in southeast Kansas? No. Okay. Um, the, the most famous person that comes from this area prior to this was Carrie Nation, the saloon buster from the Prohibition. <laughs> Bourbon County, it was, well, Uniontown, Kansas, it was, it was one of the lowest income school districts in Kansas. The town itself was really poor. I, when I got out of my car in, Uni in the, the little square uh, in, in Uniontown, um, I felt like I was walking into a Dorothea Lang photograph or a, a, a Walker Evans photograph of the Depression. Half the stores were boarded up. It was a really sad looking town. Um, I walked over to the, to the high school um, and I went and I met Norm and I met Liz, Megan, and Sabrina. And I spent a week with them and um, I, I can only say that that I fell in love with these, with these people, with this, with this story. Um, I interviewed them. I interviewed their parents, um, the, the school board members, the principal. The um, I just got a real flavor. I, I also was able to talk with some uh, uh, sur Holocaust survivors who had, who had come down from Kansas City, um, and and at, and at that point I knew well. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and, and write this uh, write this story. Um, one of the things that really, uh, that, that also compelled me, but aside from the fact that it's both a contemporary and a historical um, story, um, is about rescuers, that, this, that, that, that whole notion of rescuers. 
what would make someone put themselves and their family's life at risk in order to save strangers? Um, what, wh I, I, what sort of courage do these rescuers possess? Um, so I, I, I want to I, I read you about one rescue. This is just to give you a, a sense of, of what Irena did. She, uh, Irena told me this story when I interviewed her. Um, this particular rescue occurs on the second day of the deportations. The, um, prior to the deportations, when Irena or her network would go and ask Jewish parents to give up their, their children, many, many, if not most, said, were, were hesitant because they couldn't believe that the Germans would, could empty the Warsaw Ghetto or that they could kill 450,000 people. Um, once the deportation started, then people were eager to have the network take, take their children. And, it, and um, so this is the second day. Um, this particular rescue occurred through the courthouse. The, when the wall was built in the ghetto, it bisected the courthouse so that if you had access and keys to the underground tunnels in the courthouse, you could walk in on the ghetto side go through the tunnels and come out on the Aryan side. It was the Irena's favorite venue for rescuing kids. It was simple. It, was, it, it worked easily. Um, the Germans finally got hip to this in August of 1942, before the end of the, the, the liquidation, and then and shut it down, which was a real blow to the, to the network. But this, this particular rescue still occurs through the courthouse. Um, you're going to hear a Yiddish plea, Hobbs Rachmunes, which means please have mercy. Um, there's a reference to the Judenrat, that's that Jewish council I mentioned before, and the large and the small ghetto with that uh, bridge over it. Um, so the, the paper that Irena has written the name on of, of this child, um, it says July 23rd, 19, 1942, Guta Ettinger, this is her Jewish name, then there's an arrow, Zofia Vacek, which is her new Polish name on her forged documents, um, and Praga Markowska number 24, where she it will be fostered. When the door opened to Irena at apartment 32, Siepwa number 12, eight-year-old Guta was waiting. She stood very still behind a small battered valise, her legs so thin that her socks would not stay up. Her dark hair, though obviously just washed and braided, was dirty still. Guta's mother tied a small red bow on one braid, then straightened Guta's soiled dress. Irena turned away. She could not watch these last few moments. Mr. Ettinger's voice hoarsened and cracked. Take her quickly. Don't make us think about it any longer. Irena lingered for a moment and repeated the pretense that made this desperate act possible. After the war, you'll be reunited. I don't think so, he whispered, but thank you for that, young lady. Irena took the child's hand and walked her onto Siepwa Street, across the wooden footbridge over Hodna, then up Zelazna Street toward the courthouse. As they neared the ghetto center, the crowds became thicker, noisier, more impatient and gruff. Irena gave Guta morsels of bread as they walked. The girl gripped Irena's hand so tightly that it hurt. Red posters announced executions from the day before, some of them Judenrat members, the longest list Irena had ever seen. In the turmoil and, conf and confusion, someone pushed hard between them and broke their hands apart. Guta screamed as she was carried downstream like driftwood in a flood. Irena plunged through the melee and just managed to catch her coat. They forced their way through the throngs into the darkened courthouse lobby, just as crowded as the street, but acoustically augmented by the dark space overhead. Josef was expecting them, and the escape through the basement tunnels went smoothly. They emerged on Ogredova Street in the Aryan world of relative calm. When the number 25 tram came to a stop, Irena easily picked tiny Guta up in her arms, half as heavy as an eight-year-old should be, and boarded. A gallant young Pole, seated across from the tram operator, surrendered his seat for Irena and the child. Guta sat on her lap, her face buried in Irena's shoulder. In all the confusion, Irena had said nothing to Guta, who spoke only Yiddish. The rocking of the tram calmed Irena, enough for her to feel Guta quivering on her lap and sobbing. Other tram riders began to stare. Irena whispered in her ear in practiced Yiddish, Be calm, little girl. Your name is Zofia. Don't forget, Zofia. 
Guta lifted her head and looked at Irena, her eyes brimming with tears, her weeping no longer muffled by Irena's coat, drawing ever more attention. Hobbs Rachmunes, Guta cried. This plaintive Yiddish plea had become so ordinary in the ghetto as to go unnoticed. But on this tram, it was a confession punishable by death. Passengers whispered. Guta's sobbing grew louder. She stiffened as if in a seizure. Without warning, the tram operator applied the brake in the middle of the street, throwing passengers off balance. He looked at Guta, then began to shout, Everybody out! Everybody out! There's something terribly wrong with the tram. It's not safe. Please leave now. Leave as quickly as you can. He walked up and down the car, shooing people out the front and back doors. Irena was about to take Guta off the tram when he came near and whispered, Not you. Please stay. After the last of the passengers had fled, he closed the doors. Kneel down on the floor, he said. Guta continued to cry loudly in Yiddish. The tram started up again, screeched around corners, rocking Irena and Guta on the floor. After a long and jostled ride, it stopped on a quiet street. The driver turned to Irena. This is a quiet neighborhood. You're safe now. God be with you. Irena looked into his eyes, those of an ordinary Pole. <clears throat> Why, she asked. Why did you do it? I, I, I don't know. I just did it without thinking. You'd better go. Guta held Irena's hand, and they walked through Aryan Warsaw, across the bridge over the Vistula River to the Praga district, where she would be hidden. Guta's eyes widened with wonder, as if she had never seen clean streets, automobiles, and finely dressed women. In this part of Warsaw, there was some, there was some food in the shops, and Irena bought Guta a pastry with sugar frosting, which finally quenched her tears. So this Polish driver, on an impulse, um, d did something that, that could have cost him and his family their lives. They would have been executed. Um, again, there's this mysterious thing about what makes some people rescuers, what makes some people perpetrators. Um, there's uh, a, a biography is not necessarily destiny, and it's it, it's unclear why people make these choices. In Arena's case, when asked about this, why she would do something so dangerous as this, she said it was her father's teachings. Her father, who was a physician, had told her over and over that if you see someone drowning, you have to rescue them, even if you cannot swim. The other thing he said to her was that there are only two kinds of people in the world, good and bad, regardless of race, religion, or creed. And she said those were the, those were the two um, influences that made her do what she did. Um, it's important to understand the what the calculus of rescue was in Poland. It was very different than in other occupied countries. Um, in most of occupied Europe, uh, if you were caught hiding or feeding or assisting Jews in any way, you were executed or you were take, sent to a concentration camp. Um, in Poland, which really the most draconian of all punishments, um, if you even fed a Jew, you were executed and your family was executed. And it was often done very publicly out in the street as a warning to other, uh, other Poles not to assist the Jews. Um, this is partially a reflection of how, how the Germans demonized the Poles as well as the Jews. I mean, in, the, in their hierarchy of, of racial, of subhumanism, the Jews were at the bottom, but only slightly higher were the Poles. And it's pretty clear that the, um, that the plan of the Germans was that after they killed all the Jews, they were going to kill all the Poles and then take over Poland because that was going to be the breadbasket for, um, for Nazi Germany. Um, so. The other thing about the calculus of rescue is that in order for one Jew to be rescued, anywhere between 10 and 25 Poles would have, would have, could have been implicated in that and so really put themselves uh, at, um, at risk. Um, so incredibly, after the war, um, the, uh, and the communists took over uh, Poland and those who were part of the resistance were considered by the communists to be outlaws. The communists had no use for freedom fighters, and they, um, people who were part of the, the, the uh, underground Zhigota were routinely arrested, interrogated, um, imprisoned, some were executed. Um, so if you were a rescuer of Jews during the war, you didn't say anything. You kept it quiet. 
and there were there were severe consequences to to having it be known that you were a rescuer. Um, there were many Poles who did receive the the medal from Yad Vashem as righteous Gentiles, but they kept this hidden and didn't didn't tell anybody about it. Um, um, Irena herself was forgotten, and nobody knew really what she had done except for those people who she had rescued. Um, she was living in obscurity and in poverty uh, in a small apartment with her um, daughter-in-law and her granddaughter, sleeping on a sofa. So now here's another sort of astonishing coincidence. On September 23, 1999, um, Irena's son Adam suddenly died. Um, he was only 49 years old. He died of a, of a heart attack. Uh, Irena was 89. She was heartbroken. Her health was failing. Um, she had diabetes, high blood pressure. Everybody thought she, this was the end. She was going to die. Um, uh, unbeknownst to her, that same day, September 23, 1999, um, it, these three Kansas girls started working on a National History Day project. One of them, Liz, 14-year-old, um, came across a small article in U.S. News and World Report called The Other Schindlers. And there was this brief paragraph, the same one that was in the Holocaust calendar, um, saying that Irena had, had rescued these 2,500 children. And so they decided to do a short play about, um, about the, the, the ghetto and about Irena and about these rescues. And they called the, and they thought at that time that Irena must have been dead. They did, were able to find out that she had been arrested by the Gestapo in October of 1943 um, and had been taken to Paviak prison, and that was that, uh, the other prison in, in the ghetto. And Paviak prison was largely for political prisoners, and it was where people were executed. No, basically, you didn't get out of Paviak prison. Um, Irena escaped from Paviak prison, and no spoiler alerts. I hope you'll <laughs> read the book and find it. It's, it's, it's a pretty amazing story of how she got out. Um, so, uh, but the girls didn't know that. They, they thought she must be dead. They, they were searching cemetery records to find out where she was buried. And then all of a sudden they get word from the, um, uh, uh, they f discover that she is in fact still alive. Um, the Jewish Foundation from the Righteous had been sending her a monthly check to help support her. Um, and they got in touch with her, and they began this eight-year relationship with her until she died, um, which was just nothing short of, of remarkable and, and very heartwarming and, and touching. Um, so one of, one of the questions I asked Irena, and which many people had asked Irena, was why did she do it? And she talked about her father and what her father told her. But then she also said, and these are her words, she said, it was a need of my heart. Um, and she would reject a characterization of hero. She'd get really upset if you called her a hero. She said, I was only doing what was, what was decent. Um, she said, it was the children. The babies were the heroes of their mother's hearts. She said it was the mothers and fathers, the grandparents who gave up their children to save them. They were the heroes. And she, her greatest lament and her greatest sorrow was that for every child that they rescued, almost 100 went to their deaths at Treblinka. Um, so who are these Kansas kids? These two 14-year-olds and a 16-year-old? They're typical American teenagers. Each one of them has a significant issue about their mothers. Um, Liz, who started the project, was abandoned by her parents when she was five years old, brought up by her grandparents. Um, uh, Megan and Sabrina, um, Megan's mother became very sick during this project and eventually died. Um, Sabrina's mother suddenly died during the project. So here they are doing a project about mothers giving up their children. And, and each of them were um, carried this heavy burden about their, their own um, their own mothers. Um, the um, you know I when I think of the courage that these these three Kansas girls displayed, 
um, not not only did they um, immerse themselves in what can only be called a sewer of research um, and primary source research to do this project, and they sought the, the testimonies of survivors, uh, mostly from Kansas City, um, but they allowed me to tell their story. Before the manuscript was, before I sent the manuscript off to be published, I, 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 they each had a copy of it and I was in constant contact with them during the process of writing it. But I said, girls, and, and by the way, they said, I can call them girls, okay? <laughs> they're, they're, they're now 30 years old <laughs> and, and I, I, I still call them the girls from Kansas. And, and I've asked them many times, is this okay still? And they said, yeah, yeah, we're the girls from Kansas. Um, I, but I, I gave them the, the manuscript and I said, now's the time, I can change names. I, you know, because I, I was telling some pretty tough stories about each of their families. Um, and to their credit, they said, no, tell the story as it, um, as it happened. Um, and for those of you who have read the book, you, you know that really the last three children that Irena Sendler rescued were the girls from Kansas. And when you see the arc of each of these girls' stories, you, you'll understand that. Um, the, um, so w when the girls found out that I Irena was still alive, the, some uh, philanthropists in Kansas City raised money to send them to meet Irena. And they began this, as I said, eight-year relationship with her. But they would go back to Poland regularly to put on the play. Um, Irena helped them flesh out the, the details. The play then became a half an hour long. Um, uh, my wife and I went with them in 2005 when they, when they went to Poland. And um, one of the, just to, to give you, well, one of the things they were doing was working with Polish teenagers in, when they would go back. They would find Polish teens who were discovering the stories of unsung heroes from their own communities and telling their stories. Um, at one of the performances that we went to of the, of the play, um, this was in Warsaw at the Gazeta Wyborcza, which is the largest newspaper in, um, in Poland. It's, it's actually the largest newspaper in Eastern Europe. Um, and the, the girls were putting on the play and some of the Polish teenagers who they had been working with were in the, it, were in the audience. Um, I was sitting next, it just, to, I, I, I tell this story to give you a sense of the, the silence and the denial in Poland. Okay. Poland did not have a conversation about, there was no Polish-Jewish dialogue until, um, until 2000, really 2001, um, and in no small part due to the, the, the girls from Kansas. Because when they first came to Poland with Irena's story, it was a national sensation, and Irena became this Polish national hero, and they really helped to crack open the silence about the, about the Holocaust in, um, in Poland. Um, I'm sitting, I'm in this, at the play, I'm sitting next to this very elderly gentleman who's clearly old enough to have been um, an, an adult already in, during the war, and he's hunched over, he's, he has his hands like this, he's holding something. Um, at the end of the play, um, Megan came over with one of the Polish teenagers who she had been working with. They were, um, and they introduced me to this gentleman who was from this Polish teenager's town, his community. Um, and they introduced me and I asked him what he was holding. And he opened his hand and he showed me his Yad Vashem medal. So Yad Vashem, that's the Israeli Holocaust Authority. They are the ones who identify the, what the so-called righteous Gentiles, people who helped to rescue Jews during the Holocaust, but did it not for money or for any material gain, but did it just out of decency. Um, there are some 25,000 uh, rescuers that they have identified um, as, of, as of last year. Um, so he, sh he opened his, and, and everyone who, every one of those righteous Gentiles is given a medal, a very beautiful, large medal that identifies them as righteous Gentiles. Um, so this gentleman opens his hand, he shows me his medal, and then he explains, I have kept this buried in my basement. Ever since I got this, he says, I have only told my wife, I didn't tell my children, I didn't tell my family, I didn't tell my co-workers, nobody knew that I had, that I had done this. And he said, it was the finest thing I've ever done in my life. And, 
and it's been buried. And then he said, and then he points to the, to the girls, the, the Kansas girls, and he says, it's because these girls have come here that, and they've, they've now allowed us to have this conversation. And they've allowed this young man from my town to help me tell, tell this, um, this story. Um, and this is something that went on throughout Poland. Um, in 1996, Yad Vashem had, um, and, and actually th throughout all of Europe, in 1996, Yad Vashem had, I, had identified about 12,000 righteous Gentiles. 20 years later, that number doubled to 25,000. So all of those stories were not told between the end of the war in 1996. And then all of a sudden, this silence was really cracked open by... Um, in no small extent because of, the, because of these girls from Kansas. Um, so, uh, you know, for, for, th for a thousand years, Poland was the home of the Jews. Poland, the word, the name of the country is from a Hebrew root, that it, Poline, which means here you should dwell. And half of the world's Jews lived in Poland. Um, and then all of a sudden they disappeared. And nobody talked about it until this opening in the dialogue occurred, and these young people now are saying, they see this breach, this chasm, and they're saying, what happened to the Jews? Where are they? There are some 20,000 Jews left in, left in Poland. Um, they want to know, and they're, t they're now telling these, um, these stories as well. Um, there is um, now a Holocaust curriculum in Poland. Every child from the age of, um, of 9 to 18 has to take this very strictly set out curriculum about the Holocaust which includes a visit to one of the camps. Um, and this, uh, this curriculum was developed by a man named Robert Schuchta, who was a fellow at the um, Life and Ajari Irena Sendler um, Foundation in, um, in Kansas, which, um, and, and then he began this, uh, this program. So I, it, just to briefly, and I'm running over, I don't want to have some time for questions also, but um, just uh, to, to just very briefly talk about just the educational dimensions of this story. Um, I, in one recent survey, 66% of millennials, so this, these are kids 15 to 37 years of old, uh, 37 years of age, um, couldn't say what Auschwitz was. So um, it, we have to tell this story, we have to keep telling this story, and and I think that how we tell this story matters. Um, we have to be able to capture young people's attention. We have to capture their passion. We have to appeal to their better angels. Um, it raises the question of can we teach empathy, this, uh, a, uh, an inclination to goodness, to rescue. Um, for this history to matter, it has to be vivid, it has to be personal, it has to be compelling, it has to be their story. And again, that's what compelled me to write this, because this is a contemporary story as well as historical. Um, so, I just want to a end with a, this a, a quote from a Hebrew sage from 2,000 years ago who said, it is not for us to finish the task, but neither are we free to desist from it. Thinking about our current situation in the world, no one of us can fix this mess that we're in, but each and every one of us is a carpenter endowed with our own unique tools. The torch of history illuminates our work area, and we are inspired to repair, each in our own small way, what we can. Irena Sendler, Megan, Liz, and Sabrina, the students we teach or parent or mentor, each of us, our families, our friends, can do something. My fondest wish, my hope, my prayer, is that after reading this book, young people and other generation removed from the Holocaust will remember Irena Sendler and the Warsaw Ghetto and be inspired by these Kansas teens to do their small part to repair the world. We are all stars in a dark, dark night, and I believe it is our charge to shine. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And so uh, questions, comments? Um, 
I thought I recently have been reading at the party line now in Poland is no discussion. Silence will reign once again. It's worse than that. It's three years in prison. Okay. The, the, in 2015, the, the Law and Justice Party uh, assumed control in Poland. They're a very right-wing um, uh, government. And they passed a law that said if you say anything about Polish complicity in the Holocaust, Polish complicity with the Nazis, that that is illegal, and you are then subject to a three-year prison term. So the, the prison term has been deleted. But for three years, that was the, uh, for, uh, yeah, up until, up until last year, uh, that, that was the law in Poland. So I mean, it has, yes, so there, there is some troubling. Uh, all across. All across Europe. Uh, uh, yeah, it's astounding. Scary. Yeah. Um, and, you know, have we learned from history or are we repeated? Um, yes? Are there other people writing on these stories now that we. I had, I, I'm ashamed to say I had not heard of this book. But uh, many people, when I said I was coming here, were surprised because you have been here as. Yes, but you were here as a poet, probably, but nonetheless, people here do know about you. Who else is writing on these things? Well, just last year, a book by Tila Mazeo came out, which was a really a very scholarly look at Irena Sendler. It's, it's um, um, it, it really deeply researched book uh -huh. about Irena and the Warsaw Ghetto. The, um, there, there is now some serious scholarship about the Warsaw Ghetto, which did not exist before about 2003 or 2004, when Jacek Miacek was All that the, time. Yeah, I mean, it just, it's, it's a tribute to the, to the silence. They, you know, part of my primary research when I was preparing to, to write this book was uh, looking at memoirs, diaries, and what had been written before from what had come out of the Warsaw Ghetto. But there, there had been no, no singular scholarly work about the uh, about the ghetto. There was, there, there were diaries, there were memoirs, there were, um, th there were other sort of stories about the ghetto. There was Mila 18, which is a story about the Warsaw Ghetto and the and the uprising. Um, but yeah, it, it is now, there, there's now a, a, a large body of scholarly work. Um, many, many years ago, the Arts Council, I, I mean like 25 or so, had a show by a photographer who had come here, and I'm blocking his name, and I'm going to try to find that information again too, that had amazing pictures. And that was the only thing that Mm -hmm. I could reference when I heard you were coming. So we've had so little, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I, I know who you're talking about. and I, I wish I could I remember his wonderful his guy. Also, it was I, amazing. I, I have his book at home with the, with the photographs. And, and that, that was a photographs not only of um, some photographs of the, of the ghetto in Warsaw at that time, but also of Jewish life throughout Poland. Yeah, and, and, it was amazing. And it's a coffee table. It's a coffee, yes, right. It's, okay. And it has some remarkable photos of the you know, turn of the century. Um, uh, and that traveled and, around, so people did, but then it was gone. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So you mentioned that the girls from Kansas were involved in primary research. Wouldn't they have run into a language barrier? How did they overcome that? Well, but primary research, they, they went to the Holocaust Museum. Um, the, there, there are these diaries and memoirs that are written, that are translated from, from Polish it, um, it, into English. Um, so that, that's what they use. Yeah, they, they don't speak Polish. <laughs> um, and, and, they, uh, and, and the testimony from survivors. There's a large Jewish population in Kansas City. Um, many survivors also settled there, and so they, they have conversations with them. Um, what about your own research? Do you? Speak I don't speak Yiddish? Polish. <laughs> I speak again. I speak German, which is kind of close to Yiddish, so I can sort of badly get by in Yiddish. Um, but the um, yeah, and, and and much of my uh, research in Poland was with translators, and I had some wonderful, lovely translators who, and Irena never spoke English, so everything, all my interactions with her were through translation. I, I wanted to mention also what, what's happened to these girls. 
So, um, Liz, uh, who started out as a really kind of a pissed off young 14 year old, she was the uh, she was the one who her parents had abandoned her. She was really angry. Um, she was the kid who you would say was not going to either graduate from high school or was not going to do well after high school. Um, and she has na she has gotten her second master's degree. Her first one was in education. Her second one is in history. And she teaches Holocaust education now in a middle school in Missouri. Megan. Um, it is uh, the program coordinator for the Arena Center of Life in a Jar Foundation. The, the teacher, Norm Kennard, he retired from teaching and he set up this foundation, which is in Fort Scott, Kansas, very close to the high school. Um, and what they, what they do is they work, they're a huge foundation now, and they, they work with students, high school students typically, th around the world. They've worked with students in every state and 70 or 80 countries telling stories of unsung heroes who exemplify the legacy of Irena Sendler, of, uh, of acceptance, of respect for all people, and, and courage. Um, so that, and they continue to do that. I was, I was with them last summer in, in Kansas where we had a reunion, and they put on the, they put on the play again in, uh, in Fort Scott. Um, so this, this work carries on, and Megan is the coordinator, and she also acts as Irena in the play. When, it, when they put it on. So and they continue to go around the, um, the United States. They continue to go to Poland. They were in Poland a, a year and a half ago and did the play there again. Um, and then Sabrina is, a, is an elementary school teacher. She, she has three kids now. They, they all have, have children. Um, and they have all done really well. Yes? Is the play ever put on uh, outside of the confines of, of, the, of their work? I mean, is it, is it, is it uh, out there for somebody to say, okay, I'm going to purchase the rights to put this play on? Because I can think of about four people in Woodstock that would do it tomorrow if it, would, if it were made available to them. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's not, but I, uh, I, I'm having a conversation with Norm now. No, Norm is very protective of this story. He's had offers for, to make a movie of, of Life in a Jar. Um, and he's, he would lose control of the script. And he said, because these are, he, he was very sensitive to the fact of what can happen when you, when you give up control of, of the story. So that's, the movie has not been made unless someone gives him complete uh, authority over the script. But the play, I, okay, uh, there, um, we are starting to have conversations about release, releasing the, the, um, the, the book permission for people to craft a play, which would then have to have the approval of, of Norm and the girls um, to be produced. So stay tuned. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Our, our high school has... Oh, I, I'm sure tons Yo, of Yo Theater has drama for none and still continues after the last uh, director retired. And no, also, I'd be happy to come to Woodstock High School and give a talk about this too. So, just I, they they would welcome you, sir. <laughs> when I was doing uh, uh, research uh, uh, for the book, and I went to Poland, um, to Warsaw, I knew where the where the wall was of the ghetto, and I went out of my uh, out of my hotel, which was a block and a half away, and I couldn't find any evidence of the wall. This was 2005. There was no commemorative plaques. There was nothing. I went back in 2013 when the Polish translation of my book was released, and now there is a footprint of the wall all around, all 11 miles of the wall, there's a footprint around, and every, at every gate, every, each of the 22 gates, there's this upright cenotaph, which um, shows a, an Ombar relief of the, Warsaw get, uh, of the ghetto superimposed on a map of, of Warsaw, and a, a very detailed description of what happened. Th this is the, that footbridge I talked about. When I went back in 2005 doing research, I couldn't find any evidence of this footbridge. This was an iconic structure in the ghetto. Uh, I, we, we were having, we were at a cafe right there where the footbridge was. There was no evidence of it at all. I come back in 2013, and there are, there's now this gigantic sculptural steel um, uh, r rendering of where the um, where the, the footbridge was. The, these are two giant girders that um, at the base uh, is a blue searchlight that shines up into the night um, each each night. It, it is it, it is truly a, a heroic rendering of where this was. And at the base, there's a, a view box where you can where you see these three-dimensional photos of the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, 
In 2013, when I went back, I gave a talk at a school, at an Irena Sendler School in Warsaw. That, they're like the John F. Kennedy schools in, in America. Um, there were 25 in 2013. Now there are 35 in Poland. There's, there's also um, there's three Irena Sendler schools in Germany. There's one in France, there's one in England, um, another one oh, two years ago opened in Brazil. Um, so uh, this is the first visit of the girls to, with Irena. So there's Megan, Liz, and Sabrina, and their, their first m meeting with Irena. Which is <laughs> um, and this was the performance where I met that gentleman with, uh, with the Yad Vashem medal. Um, this is Irena in 1939, when she started doing all this. Um, and Irena now, that's her nurse's uniform that she used to get in and out as, a, um, as an infection control nurse. Um, that was her 95th birthday party, where she gave us an hour-long lecture. You have, to, you have to understand, Irena said was 4 feet 11 inches tall. She's a tiny woman. And she would go, you know, two or three times, we'd go past the Nazis <laughs> through the gate, in and out of the ghetto. Um, and uh, she's 95, and she had written this, uh, on a yellow legal pad, this hour-long lecture that she gave to us, which was, uh, and she was just so completely clear in her mind. You could see how she could organize this complex rescue network um, to work. And by the end of the lecture, she's shaking her hands at, at George Bush for invading Iraq. She was just <laughs> furious with him. <laughs> so... <laughs> her, her legacy. So I, I'd be happy. I have books back here if you would like. <laughs> Thank you all again for coming this evening.